happened was when Matt McDonald uh, had that party, and we were watching the Tennessee Florida game, and then we oh, made a yeah. bet. Yeah, yeah, we made the bet. We were like, yeah, uh, it's gonna be a shootout. So every time uh, Florida doesn't score. <laughs> I'll take a shot. And you're like, every time Tennessee doesn't score, I'll take a shot. It was like zero, zero going into the fourth quarter. And then, yeah, yeah, that was like one of the craziest days. Dude, great, I great know, times. I didn't know it got humid in North Carolina. Cause I just thought no, it was yeah. different than everything else. No, that's what I, I thought it was. You get hot and I was humid, bro. Like you go outside. Luckily being from Florida, like it's kind of somewhat preparing me for when we run outside. Cause some kids are just like, this is terrible. It's not like that in, uh, in, uh, in Massachusetts. Wait, that's where Harvard's at Massachusetts, right? Yeah, Cambridge, Massachusetts. I mean, like, it's kind of humid up there because it's, like, right on the body of water, but not nearly like this. It's not the same. No, not the same, but it's yeah, like... How are, uh, how are the summers up there, though? Because, I mean, I can only imagine the winters were brutal. So, I only spent one summer, actually, on Harvard's campus because, like, when it comes to, like, football stuff, they don't, like, subsidize housing, like, for you and stuff. So, like, you'd have to get, like, either an internship that pay for your living or you'd have to be, like, a resident tutor or something like that for, like, a summer program. So by one summer I had up there, it was it was really hot. Like, bro, it would touch like a hundred sometimes. Like yeah. it would literally be like Florida heat, but yeah. like it's just for a shorter period. So even yeah. if so you're full wait. So if you're at Harvard as a football player, there's not like summer workouts or like summer programs or like like this. So this? There is, but it's the living is on your own. So it's like if you were to do some workouts, you have to find somewhere to live and pay for it somehow. No way. And that's because you're not on athletic scholarship, right? Yeah, I'd assume so. Like, that's the only that rational reason. insane thing. to think about. But, like, now at, at Duke, it, they're, they're helping you out with everything. Yeah, no, like, they uh, feel like summer stipends. Like, they have me in this apartment, which is really nice. I think I'm going to live here for the fall, too. That's crazy. So, we just had Julian on uh, yesterday, actually. And he was talking about that, too. And he's like, there's a lot of things that, like, because he wrestles at Cornell, which is Ivy League as well. He's like, we're Division One. He goes, but since we're Ivy League, we don't get the full like Division One love that like most. No, them. not at all. Yeah, and you. I'm assuming you felt that as well at Harvard. Yeah, I mean, like I would say, the talent is easily Division One. Like I've played with some of like the freakiest athletes, but it's like you just no one really pays attention to it. Like you don't get the funding, all that stuff. So you're really just like, I would say they treat you like a glorified club sport, mm-hmm. but like. At the same time, it's like you're still putting in all the work that you would see at, like, any other major school, but just with, like, less resources. I mean, I feel like a lot of FCS and D- Division II, like, schools can, like, attest to that. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, like, I was, like, the coaching staff at Harvard and all that stuff, they give you everything you can ask for within their power. Like, they try to give you all the resources need be to make you the best way you can be, though. Yeah. So what was, like, the college environment for games, like at, like, at Harvard compared to, like, well, I guess you haven't played at Duke yet, but, like, what was it like? like compared to high school, I'd say? Um, definitely more people in high school because, like, as Grayson knows, like, Jesuit didn't hold too many people. Like, TC games are always fun, too. But, like, I, mean, I would say – our... Some big games, though. Like, there was definitely in your high school career some big games where there was, like, sold-out stadiums. Yeah, the American Heritage game. That was the Heritage lot. games, the TC game, you know. Like, yeah, they, I don't know if you played against CCC, but they those games are pretty big, too. Yeah, I would say, like – at Harvard, we had a couple of really big games. Obviously, the Harvard Yale game. Like we yeah. played in Fenway my freshman year. That was crazy. Um, my last two years when I played them, those were sold out in the Yale Bowl, like 50, 60,000 people. And then um that Brown will play like a couple. Like those are big games. They're Friday night games have like twenty two thousand people. So like they're really fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah, what's it? Was that? The Harvard Yale, dude, that's crazy. Cause like that's something that's like it's kind of like Jesuit TC an aspect where like, it doesn't matter how good those team, how good Harvard or Yale is that year. It doesn't matter anything. It's like anybody can be anybody and it's always sold out. It's on TV. Like that's a huge deal. What was it like, you know, being able to be a part of it's history. It's historic. What was it like to be part of that yeah. historic rivalry? Bro, it was crazy. I would say like, I don't think you understand like in it, how many people are actually invested until you once you finish you're like, Oh, like people's grandparents care about this. Like this is like do or die for like people who are only invested in Ivy League sports. And like I would say I've played in like easily three of like the most memorable. Like one, but the first time ever in Fenway, that was like I said, electric. Like the whole stadium sold out. Red Sox just won the World Series that year. And then like um <clears throat> like my sophomore year, 
the one where like there's a went to double overtime there's like since the protests we we're playing yeah that's what i want yeah i wanted to bring that up with you what what that exactly was happened there um so harvard and yale students mostly harvard students were trying to get harvard to divest in fossil fuels and so if you know like harvard is pretty much a large corporation whereas they invest their money all across like different assets and sectors to like really make sure their endowment's growing at like a solid rate however many forever years right so they were, I guess, investing in some things that a lot of students think were controversial that would, um, like, mount, like affect the earth in a poor way. So they thought the best way to do that would be demonstrate during halftime of a Harvard Yale. Um, so that was that. So like, kids jumped on the field. Like a lot of them were, were they like, strong. yeah, they were like, they had, like letters painted on them and stuff too, right? So that's the thing. Like a lot of them were doing it, but then like probably half of them were just drunk students that wanted to be on the field that didn't oh, know what was sure. going on. Yeah, for sure. They saw so that those kids like, got on the field. They're like, oh, we're going on the field too. Yeah, that's that. I remember that being a huge issue. And I remember, I, I don't know if it was exactly. long ago. So like we were in the locker room and they're like, yo, be around the field. And we're like, what? Yeah, can you guys hear me? I think. Can you hear me, Grayson? Yeah, you hear me? Yeah. Nelly. No, you kind of like. Let's go real back, uh, back step just a second. So those kids ran on the field to protest the fossil fuels, you were saying? Yeah, divesting fossil fuels. And then like, it just blew out of proportion because once some kids started seeing they could get on the field, all the kids wanted to run and get on the field. Yeah, so like we were in the locker room for like an hour and 15 minutes. It was crazy. This is at halftime too, right? Yeah, so like we we're there's probably like five six minutes before we're supposed to go back out maybe 10 and then we ended up being there for another hour and 15 minutes that would suck because i feel like you get cold and you have to like re-warm up your entire body no yeah we were also winning at halftime so like i feel like we definitely had like a good flow going in the game and then like at that point it was just a whole new game in the second half like it was just to restart your whole vibe everything so it was definitely threw off the flow of the game wasn't there yeah. um it, I mean, this wasn't like a controversy but i don't remember if it was while you were there it was like right before it was definitely recent um, that like the Harvard fans trolled the Yale fans or maybe vice versa. And like they held up. The yeah. That was, team. that was before I got there. They, <laughs> yeah. I think it was Harvard sucks. Or something like that. They like given out, they dressed up, gave out all these posters, like panels, like, like hold it up when it says to hold it up. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That was, that's funny. I mean, like, regardless, that's hilarious. Yeah. yeah. What did back to that game though, where the protests came on the field, did y'all like find out yourselves as players or, like did the coaches have to like tell y'all like hey we can't go back out because there's a protest going on and and what did they kind of like do to keep y'all in the game because like that's like completely out of nowhere like you don't really know how to prepare for that i like i remember like we had people like because you can walk back out like at halftime like before it gets like if we're like right about to go out so, like people walk out we hear like clamoring and like stuff like that and like they would tell us, yo, some people are on the field. I think the coaches or someone came in and told us, like, we were all like, what are you talking about? So then we started going out a little bit and looking, and, like, you just see a bunch of people on the field. And so at that point, like, you try to stay locked in, but, like, after an hour and 15 minutes, like, the coach can only say so much. You're just sitting there, like, twiddling your thumbs, waiting, like, hey, like, security's got them off the field. Like, you can play football again. So it's just, like, talking about the game so far, like, and you're just kind of sitting around. Like, there's only so much you can, like, really do to lock in for that long and, like, especially, like, something you've never seen before. Like, I've never heard of kids rushing a field to protest, yeah. like, yeah, what? social issues and, like, in the middle of the biggest game of the year. So I was, like, really confused. Yeah, dude, I feel like that that's just, like, so hard to, like, get your mindset back into it because, like, halftime you kind of, like, crash a little and you rewarm up and you wake back up. And now you're doing, like, a whole hour, over an hour. I feel like I would just be slumped. Like, all the lactic acid build up would just like, <laughs> I would just be like, I don't even want to go back on the field. And then on top of that, it's like you're really trying to figure out like what's going on in the situation. Like, why are they out there? What are they doing out there? Like, how are they getting me out the field? Like, can we help do this? Like, so there's a bunch of like bullshit kind of like cloud in the air. So it was really, really and annoying. Regardless, though, regardless of your opinion, like all of our opinions on the topic, what what they did drew attention to what they wanted. So I mean, you got to no hundred percent. Like, off. I think it was definitely effective. It just sucks that it was at my expense, but <laughs> yeah. it's bigger than me. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. But uh, no, so let's back up a little. So we were just talking about, um, you know, before we started some of your scholarships and stuff. So I was looking through your your 24 seven. Uh, everyone that doesn't know Nelson played at Tampa Jesuit, a three year varsity starter, was definitely one of the most impactful players in the field every single time he stepped on the field. Um, and you really went through, a, I don't I don't know how to call it a transition or 
maybe just like growing up, but like your, your freshman, the sophomore year, the sophomore to junior senior year was like a completely different Nelson. Like you just became a monster. And uh, before we start talking about like the college and stuff, what was it that like really changed you? And like, like, do you think it was just growing up or you think like you started understanding the grind? Like what was it that made you make that jump? Like, I'm not saying you were bad freshman year, but I'm just saying that I felt like your sophomore to junior senior year was just like, wow. Like it was lights out. Like you were the best kid on the field every time you touched the field. Definitely puberty, bro. Like I came in like five, seven, five, eight, my freshman year. Like I just really liked football. Like definitely wasn't the most athletic person. Like my sophomore year, I like grew up to like five eleven, like lights out of six foot, but like five eleven, two hundred and fifteen. And then like my junior, like going to my junior year, like I did like the same work as I worked out with um Coach Sherman, great trainer in Florida, Tampa area, like shout out to him. So I would do those two days, like sophomore, summer, stuff like that, and just like growing up eating more than I got up to like about six two, six one and a half, and then like I think I put my junior in like 230. Mm-hmm. And then from there, like I just, just kept working on stuff like that. So I think like the work ethic was definitely there for my sophomore and senior, like consistently, but it was more like my body became more and more like accustomed to playing football and definitely got up to par with the position I played. And I definitely think that helps my production on the field. No, for sure. So did you play football before you got to high school at all? Or did you start like once you got to high school? No, I've played since I was a kid. Like, um, I played like pretty much every position growing up. Like when I got to like little league, I got obviously I blew up a little bit. So like I definitely started playing like the O line interior type stuff. And then, like, baby. Yeah. Since then I was like, yo, this is really fun. Like less running, big lifestyle, like you need whatever. So like that was definitely the vibe when I was in little league. So I just kind of stuck on the line. Yeah. Now were you T B Y F L or Pop Warner? T B Y F L. Carol Cardinals. Dude, what's yeah, it? Not, so not the, we're gonna bring yeah. it up to you because we had to bring it up to Bentley. The TBYFL versus Pop Warner debate. Okay, there's been a lot of heat talking about who produces better players and who does better. I want to hear from someone that played TBYFL. Just better players than TBYFL. Like I don't. I think I just think there's like from from my knowledge, like I played against kids that are now in the NFL. Like all, all these guys, there's athletes like. Kendrick played too. I felt Travell, Malik. I mean, I know Ray McLeod also played. Had to play them. I played up, so I had to play against like all these like great athletes, and I'm just like an underwhelming child. So I was like, <laughs> so I played all those guys. And I'm like, I personally think too. I felt, but you know, people may sound biased. Well, you know, it's gone now, right? You know, it's the league doesn't exist anymore. Really? Yeah, because it was no. a shooting, it was a shooting last year at the at one of the games. I want to say it was a Raiders game. Don't oh my goodness! On that, but they the league disbanded. There's no more TBYFL. So it's all now. It's all taught like Pop Warner. Yeah, now it's all Pop Warner. I mean, I'm assuming there's going to be like a. I mean, obviously, I don't. I'm not following youth football in Tampa, but <laughs> if something came up and they try to take the spot of it, or you know, there's just too much yeah. talent there to just not. You can't have one organization in Tampa. There's just too many kids playing football. It just yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like you just need like way more teams. So and it wouldn't work. But I do think uh, all my. I would say the majority of my friends. Growing up, played TBYFL. Um, I, I don't really know if there's a huge difference. I played in the Berkeley Private School League, so I, I'm not one to talk about, like, difficulty. But, I mean, I feel like if, you, if you're playing football in Florida and you're good, they're going to find you regardless. Like, I just, yeah, I mean, like, I think I'm, I'm just, like, messing around. But, like, I've, all these leagues have such great talent. It's like there's just so many kids that are in Tampa, Florida area that are just, like, great at sports. So it's like. Uh, there's there's gyms in every league, every league that you're gonna look at. Yeah. So now, like I said, going on from that, looking over uh, your offers. So you had a lot. You had ba- virtually almost every single Ivy League school gave you a scholarship. You know, you had a lot of Ivies. You had a couple of the military academies through some scholarships, um, and you had like some very solid Group of Five schools. But your only uh, Power Five, if I'm not mistaken, was Washington State. Yeah. So when you were going through your recruitment process. Talk us a little bit what it was like, you know, knowing, and I always, I always said this about you too. I was like, if it, I feel like the eye test was one reason why you didn't get some of the bigger offers because you were too short or anything in that aspect. But talk us what it was like going through that recruitment process of, you know, maybe not getting the offers you thought you deserved or maybe even getting these Ivy leagues that opened your mind. What was, what was your whole recruitment process like in high school? Uh, I mean, it was, it was real weird. Cause like personally, it was like, I didn't, I've always wanted to play in the NFL since I was, like, a kid. But, like, ever since I got to high school, freshman, sophomore, junior year, like, 
everyone's like, oh, you're too short, you're too short. So, like, I didn't even have any, like, expectations, like, I'd get big offers or even, like, be able to continue in college. Like, I would love to. So, like, I always worked really hard to, like, just do the best I could. And then junior actually started getting offers to school, and I was like, this is mind-boggling. Like, it's great I get the opportunity. So, it was like, I never really felt like, oh, I deserve these offers. Because, like, like I said, like, everyone's always said, you're too short to do this, you're too short to do that, you're not fast enough, all this stuff. So, it's like... I would say I was really happy with all the offers I got. Um, Washington State was really tough not to go to, especially with Travell going there. So I was like, I really thought about going there with my mom and like parents didn't want me like on the opposite corner of the country. That is the farthest place you could have gone. Exactly. So like my mom was like, I don't, I don't know. Like none of my family ever be able to see me because I have no family on the West Coast. And then on top of that, like my mom's a huge um, advocate for education, like and then went to Notre Dame, went to Penn Wharton. Like, so she's education first. She didn't really know too, too much about football, but like she tries her best. So like, she was really sold on the Ivy League schools. And my dad was more across, like he was um, one of the type of guys like go where you feel like welcomed and go where you want. Like, I know football is your dream. So do what you think would be best for that. So a combination of both, I was like, if the NFL is going to come calling, they're going to call, like they can call me from anywhere. So it's like, why not choose like going to like a school like Harvard. So like the recruiting process, like I said, was a wild ride. It was like crazy to think schools would pay for me to go there. Mm-hmm. And then like on top of that, like, I mean, you meet so many cool people in there too. Like I met so many kids that are all across the country just due to like, oh, we have an offer in there too. Like just talk about the school and stuff like that. So I don't know if that's your question. <laughs> I'm sorry, sir. Yeah, so how many kids at Harvard were like from Florida? Like when you first went there, like, did you have anyone well, up there that went with you originally? There's a solid amount, right? I mean, when I went, I was the only kid in my class from Florida. No, like really? you yeah. football in your football class. Yeah, football yeah, class. Yeah. You know I know kids because okay. Leo Tarantino went there for wrestling in the hour. Yeah. yeah, I met Leo a couple of times. Really cool kid. Um, but the year before, actually, the quarterback from American Heritage was our safety, Jason Brown. So that was a fun, fun reunion. He's definitely like he wanted to smack him so hard. <laughs> nah, that's my boy. That's my boy. He was definitely one of the guys that helped me get through like my first year at Harvard in the transition, getting there, which was really tough. But like, he was he was a great uh, great resource. But like, ever since I left, I mean, after my freshman year, we started bringing more Harvard, like Florida kids, like Charlie Dean. Uh, you already know Tampa Catholic, Tampa boy. Then you have um, Kirk Castillo from St. Thomas Aquinas. And then we have a couple guys from um, the Orlando area. Like, yeah. So we, I think we're up to like maybe nine. Well, since mm-hmm. the other guys left, maybe like six now. Now, so you're talking about, you know, we're getting the huge, the giant offers. You didn't really have a familiarity or comfortability with anybody at Harvard. So was it purely a- academics or like what, what really drew Anthony Nelson to wanting to wear crimson and, and playing for Harvard? I would say like, because I mean, like, I had seen some guys that played in the Ivy League, and like, if you're a Tampa fan, you know that like Cameron Brait went there, you know, Ryan Fitzpatrick went there. Like, there's like a lot of guys that go from these schools, and I'm like, if I want to have the best of both, I know that they have like a very good program, they've always put out like great players, like, hence the guys I've seen while I'm there. Like, you have great talent there, so I really feel like it was the best of both worlds. Then, on top of that, they did a great job recruiting, like. The guy who recruited me, Anthony Facillo, Coach Facillo, shout out him. He was a great recruiter, super dope dude. And then getting on campus, like, I think the team did a great job of, like, bringing in the recruits and showing them, like, yo, this is a family. Like, we really want you here. And, like, you're going to feel at home regardless. So I felt it was, like, definitely, like, a personal level when you get to, like, the um, the school, not really, like, a factory of, like, all right, bring kids in. You're dispensable. Put them out. Yeah. Yeah, that's so awesome. you, you talked about. Uh, some kids helping you through like your transition year, your first year at Harvard, what would you say was like the most difficult part of the transition? Was it just like a homesick thing or just like a comfortability yeah. thing? Like Grayson said school, like you just get thrown in, like you get up there like you don't really get there over summer. So you get up there in the beginning of August, you move in, you pick your classes, you figure it out and you just go straight into season, like preseason camp. So it's like, it's kind of a whirlwind. You're like, all right, like I have to figure out what do I want to do? Like, these classes aren't just like required. Do I want to go on this path maybe of a major? And then you're like, all right, I have to get ready for practice. And then anybody who's ever played football knows preseason camp is hell. Yeah. So yeah. it was so, just a lot. That's really weird. So you're not even there. Cause I feel like say you went to Duke your freshman year, you would have been up there in the summer, working with the team all summer, lifting the team all summer. And then yeah. preseason would have kind of flowed in. 
versus mm -hmm. now it's a lot more like independent work with everybody and then you come together as a unit right before season starts that, how was that because even like in high school there was still an aspect of team working in the summer before preseason yeah no it's just like you get admitted and then you really do come up like prior to I don't know why or the reason for that like I don't know if it's like an FCS thing or like an Ivy League thing mm -hmm. but it's like once you get up there bro, like you, you just kind of get thrown in so it's like you really got to learn on the fly and all that stuff no, so I, I really feel like it would help for the transition for a lot of people if like kids could be up all over summer because like as you see like like or like as you said like you definitely need some type of cohesion before going in now that speaking on transition like Zach said of life what was the biggest transition for you football wise from like high school to, to college or to division one college, what was like the biggest thing that you were like, wow, I, I didn't realize I need to work on that more. I didn't realize this is so important at this level. Staying healthy. Like that's like the name of the game. Like make sure you do everything to your body to make sure it can get through these practices and stuff like that. Cause like speed of the game, that was definitely tough. Like no matter you go to college, like speed of games can be tough. Like the first, I don't know, like month, couple weeks, however your transition is. But, like, the biggest thing is, like, you go through these practices, like you have to learn what to do to keep your body in the best physical shape so you can keep going. Because, like, you could be the third best person, but if the first two are great and get hurt, you're now up. So it's, like, I would say staying healthy and figuring out what my body needs to do that. Yeah, I think another issue with that is, too, is, like, when you're in high school, your, your body's recovering and your metabolism so fast. That, yeah. Yeah, you could skip a stretch every now and then, or you could skip a – a recovery day now and then versus like now at my age, if I don't stretch before practice or I don't do some recovery after like a hard grind practice, I'm going to feel it for weeks. Like, like yeah, I'm an old man, bro. Like I warm up before warms now. Like I go in prehab, all that stuff. And so it's like, you really got to do the extra stuff to make sure your body's in the right spot. Yeah. That's a, that's a big thing. I feel like a lot of kids that I try to tell, like, especially when I was a high school wrestling coach this year, I was just like, dude, like stretch, stretch all the time, stretch before you practice, warm up, don't just go zero to hundred. Like, like obviously, there, dude. I, when I was in high school, I didn't roll out, I didn't have a roll out, yeah. I, didn't, I didn't do pre workout, I didn't do any of that. I just went to practice, and now it's yeah. like so many things I do just to make sure I'm able to practice to compete. Yeah, Nelson, what was it like, um, like playbook wise? transitioning from like the high school to division one level like did you have to learn any new techniques or different stunts or even more like film study like how was that um i mean film study 100 percent. like if you're in high school you think you do film study like college is just obviously a ne next level film study like mm -hmm. you're watching film all the time uh techniques yeah i mean it really depends on the defense um i mean like when i played at harvard our defense was like i wouldn't say similar to our jesuit but like they definitely had like traces where it was a little easier to pick it up i so mean so far dude, uh, harvard was a four three okay so like um but here here at duke like i'm still learning i mean it's my like second week here like i'm actually going like 16 days so i'm still picking the stuff up um like i said a lot of movements and stuff like that i would say definitely the film study is the biggest jump personally techniques are like across the defensive line is like Obviously, it's different with each program, but I would say there's, like, the core of, like, hands, feet, hips, like, be able to redirect, stuff like that, eye discipline. But, like, I would definitely say that the film study and, like, maybe even the playbook is definitely the biggest jump because there's just more intricacies when you get to college because there's more things to defend, like, yeah, RPO. So actually, had, like, you don't really run RPO in high school that much. Like, Oh, yeah, no, not at all. We had, and especially not a Jesuit, especially not a Jesuit. Yeah, no, we just power. Run. It's just run. It's power right, power right. Yeah. Malik Davis. But, uh, Malik Davis. We talked to Jordan, uh, Jordan Young about it, who's at, at UF, and he was like, yeah, he was just remember playing in call in high school, and it's like you have a blitz package, you have a man, you have a cover two, three, four. He's like, that he's like, it doesn't really change. Yeah. He's like, then I go to UF and I have 18 ways to run cover four. I have 20 ways to run cover two. There's 10 different diff blitz packages. So he was talking about that a lot. And then when we talked to Bentley, Bentley was like, when you talk about speed of the game, he's like, the guys aren't faster. He's like, it's not like the guys in high school to college are faster because it's, it's like a lot of reaction time and like understanding the plays. And that's what he was saying. Still, uh, film study was really, really big for him because he's like going out there and if he, he can read the play, especially as a defender, if he knows the play before it happens, he can make the play before the ball is even thrown. Yeah. So like, so like you're saying, it's the IQ of the game. It's the like the reactionary and like, that's what I put it. I would say it's like the, 
yeah, seeing the development of play through like knowing what's going to happen is like, if you know your defense in and out, you can then predicate your next move of what's going to happen. So it's like, I would definitely say you got to study way more than like in high school. Cause like Jesuit D line, right, left, straight. Yeah, I'm better, I'm better than the kid in front of me. I'm going to bully him. Like, yeah, so it's like, but this stuff is like, you actually have to do a lot more reading at the defensive end or drop position, which I'm playing. So it's like, yeah, you just got to be able to recognize plays better. Um, but that just comes with time, film study, and like just preparation. Yeah, this is like a developmental process, I would say. Yeah. But um, so you did three years, four, you know, you did four years at Harvard, mm. but one of those years was a COVID year. So what, yeah. was, what was that like, uh, you know, being an Ivy League athlete during the COVID time? I mean, I was at home the whole time, like just working out, um, had an internship. So it was really just work and work out and online classes just to get back to the season. Definitely sucked because like, when you get back, like I feel like you're shaking off rust for like two months. And it's like at that point, you're already in season. So it's like wasn't definitely the best season of my senior year, but like. And I'm not going to say you're going to blame that on COVID. I would just say, like, it just it's just tough to be able to miss that much football. It was just kind of like a bummer. And what, like, a lot of people don't understand the thing about the Ivy League. So at all sports took a time of pause when COVID hit, obviously. But when most sports came back, Ivy League didn't. And this wasn't just football. It was across the board. There was no wrestling. There was no this. So it no was sports. There was actually a kind of a controversy about people with the Ivy League. You know, there's a lot of people talking about, like, are they really doing it for the proper reasons? Like, this and that. And you start to see a lot of transfers. You start to see a lot of people transferring and leaving. They're like, I'm not, not going to perform and compete, you know, in my sport. So that was – I feel like that was going back to what we were talking about earlier, too. Like, even though you're Division One, it's still, like, the Ivy League first and then Division Oh, yeah. You know? And then to, to transition into that, let's talk about FCS playoffs. What was it like going to Harvard knowing, like, no matter how well you guys played that year, you could be in North Dakota State, you could be in whoever, you, they weren't going to let you get a postseason try. It just wasn't going to happen. Definitely tough. Definitely tough. I mean, I still don't – can't wrap my head around it. I think it was something along the lines of it would disrupt finals. But I'm like, kids go out during finals week. Like, it doesn't – like, that's not going to change it. So, Is that like I the was like, sport? That's like the Ivy League. Because it's, it's not the FCS. It's Ivy League. No, it's the only Ivy League. I, I genuinely couldn't give me an answer on why or what their rationale was. But I mean, I, I would say like I'm definitely was disappointed because like we've had my last year, we had a great year. Um, like even besides just Harvard, like Yale, Dartmouth, like these good Princeton, like they've had great teams that like easily would go deep into the playoffs. Like if you have three teams that are ranked in the top twenty nationally in FCS polls, I think one of them should have a chance to play in the playoffs. Yeah. But like it's never the case. So it was like at least my last year, I know like. Harvard, Yale, no, Harvard, Princeton, and Dartmouth are all ranked in the top 18 at one point. Dude, like I remember it point. was like two or three years ago. It was either Dartmouth or Princeton. I can't remember, but they finished like nine and one and they were ranked, so, yeah. they were ranked like 11th and they couldn't even play in the playoffs. Yeah, no, that's usually how it goes. Like, I think this year we Harvard finished like top 25, top 24. At one point we were 16. And like, no matter, no matter what you do, like, it doesn't matter. Like, it doesn't matter. Like, so it's like, it's definitely disheartening to an extent because, like, I feel like the Ivy League would get more notoriety, more like a better like chances for kids in the Ivy League to like pursue their dreams in the NFL. With that exposure on the like big stage, competing against competition, the NFL scouts would be like, "All right, this is more legitimate than maybe inner Ivy League play." So it's like, it just kind of sucks. Yeah. So you you touched a bit on like the COVID year, and for the most part, uh, like most athletes hated their time during the COVID year. Was there anything that you kind of gained from it though, or that you felt helped you grow as a football player, as a person through the COVID year? I think it definitely solidified like the love of the games. Like I have a whole year off, like I'm literally just working out and like the world shut down, but it's like, you're doing this for what? Like how bad do you really want to like do the thing that you love? So it's like worked out like damn near every day. So it was like that kind of like just reaffirmed, like no matter what's going on, I still want to play football. Like this is definitely the sport for me. And like, I want to do everything in my power to be able to be the best of what I can or be the best at the sport that I can. So I would, I would say that that definitely helps my determination and then definitely just discipline. Yeah. And so the people don't, uh, the people that, that are listening don't understand. So you actually left Harvard 
Now, I, I'm going to tell you what I think we last talked about, so you might need to help me out here. You left Harvard because – Due to the COVID year, if you stayed, it counted as two years of eligibility or something like that? So if you stayed enrolled, that counts as two semesters. And you can only have eight semesters on campus, air quotations, uh, on an Ivy League campus. So I had my freshman year to sophomore year. Well, we got kicked out soft. Yeah, sophomore March is spring. Sophomore year, yeah. March, first week of March. And that still counted as a second semester. Oh, and wow. then... Yeah, so then going into my junior year, I decided to stay enrolled, just get my degree. Because I knew we get a year back of eligibility, so like we can see what the transfer portal is like, because that's when it really started kicking off. And then, so my two year or two semesters online from junior year counted as like all Even semester. Even though you were in Tampa. Yeah, even though I was in Tampa, taking online classes, that counted as um, time on campus. Those were my two semesters. So that was a year gone. And then I came back for my senior year, played in the fall, and then decided like, hey, I think the transfer portal will be the option for me to go like pursue another like opportunity. Even though I'm getting my degree in like the end of the year. So it's like, I'd rather just get my degree and go see what I can do. So you're telling me you sat at home for your, for, I mean, obviously the reason was for your health and stuff and you couldn't play football, which I get, but like, it didn't even matter the reason you didn't go to school there. You were all online and they mm -hmm. counted that towards your eligibility. The, I mean, like, yeah, I mean, technically on campus at Harvard. So it's like, you could have been anywhere. You could have even been on campus because they let freshmen on campus for the fall and then seniors and then some juniors in the spring. Cause some of my roommates that went back up. To like graduate like, stuff. Yeah. So it was like you're there, but that's your time on campus. Those are those counts your two semesters. Dude, that is insane. And that's not an Ivy League thing. That was a Harvard thing. I believe all Ivy Leagues do that, but I would have to ask somebody else. But I know for a fact it's a Harvard thing, and I believe it's an Ivy League thing. That is insane. So, so you talked you talked about going into the transfer portal when it was like first kicking off per se because I know now it's like kind of like blown up mm -hmm. um, especially in media what was it kind of kind of like being there during like the beginning of it like were you kind of like nervous about like just putting yourself out there to all these schools or were you like kind of just like having faith in your own ability that a school will find you and like you'll get a chance somewhere I mean like I say a little bit of both, but definitely put myself out there. Like I emailed a bunch of schools, like just wanting an opportunity. Cause like, I think I got in maybe like the second year. It's like the year before we had guys usually transfer out for their fifth year. Like mm -hmm. Liam Shannon went to LSU, like Eric Wilson, Penn State, like um, say Wingfield, Wake Forest, Devin Darrington, UVA. So the type of the kids, like they graduate, they use their fifth option, go grad transfer somewhere else. So like with the transfer portal now going like, I was definitely like, all right, like I've played with these kids, like I can gauge my talent. I feel like I'd have opportunity at like a school that I think I would want to play at. And so like once I put my name in the portal, I definitely went to emailing kids, like emailing as many schools I could find that I want to play there that maybe fit the system and stuff like that. Following coach on Twitter is DMing. And like that was really like the process. So did you ever have um like I don't even know if this is loud, but like were there ever like kids on teams that like you would be like, hey, can you like Tell your coach about me or like hey maybe like kind of get coach's attention anything like that like where other no not be really because i mean like as to an extent like how much can like a player really do i mean i've asked my guys like hey like you guys like what's the team looking like or like a lot of people leaving because of covid so like and they're like no everyone's saying for covid like i probably wouldn't spend too much time trying to email these coaches but they're like oh yeah like most people are graduating or like then i'm like all right cool and then like i'll try to go email coaches but like I never really had like kids trying to like go talk to a coach because like I, I just feel like that wouldn't be as productive or as efficient. So let's go. Let's back it up just a step. What was that like? Uh, talk us through what it was like. Realization and, and making the decision. All right, I know I need to leave and I need to enter the transfer portal now. And, like, who did you talk to and stuff? And what was it like telling Harvard and and how did they take it? Well, I mean, Harvard. I mean, the coach at Harvard is kind of like a normal thing for us because they know how like you only have eight semesters, so it's like you would have to take a whole spring off. You'd have to take your senior spring off to come play in the fall and then do the whole COVID thing. And that means no classes at all, like not even online. Like it's a whole No, camp. you're not allowed to be on campus. Yeah. And so like say I was just a normal student four years ago. If you wanted to play your fifth year, you have to take your spring semester off, off campus, do something, and then come back for that fall and play your fifth year. So with COVID and all that stuff, like it was just insane. It was like just all over the place. My mom really wanted me to graduate because the uncertainties with COVID and whatnot. So it was like, so the coaches, they're really receptive because it's like, kind of a normal process 
they're like, all right, definitely understand that, especially with the COVID thing. You have so many kids backlogged years with taking time off and like whatnot. So wasn't that crazy? Receptive help to like helping, like all the stuff supportive. So the realization, like, hey, it's time to leave was more like, oh, well, I'm a senior now. Like, what am I gonna do in the spring? Either take time off, I'd have nowhere to live. Finding a job for once and that's gonna be tough. So I was like, I'm just gonna get my degree and then um really just call it and then see what I can do with the next next chapter of my life. Yeah. So originally uh you committed to Villanova out of the transfer portal with a teammate, but then you ended up flipping the freeze, Duke, right? Yeah, with uh yeah, your 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 video is frozen, we can hear you. So yeah, back Zach, pick it back up. Yeah. So um, originally out of the transfer portal, you committed with a teammate from Harvard to Villanova, and then you ended up flipping to Duke, correct? Yeah, that was actually my roommate, Daniel A. Brown. Yeah. Oh, okay. Shout, well, out, shout out Daniel, by the way. He's a great kid. I've talked to him. No. On the so how yeah, did that kind of work like, out? And how did that like why why Villanova at first, and then I guess like why Duke being like your final I mean, choice. Villanova, well, it's a great school, great program. They made it to the semifinals last year or quarterfinals great, last year. The FCS. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Great football team, great coaching staff. Like, shout out to all the coaches that gave me the opportunity there. Like, they're super receptive. And, like, I would say, like, that place felt like home, too. So, like, I went there, really enjoyed all my time, met all the players. Like, they're super dope people. And, like I said, a great education. So, I mean, like, from there, that was definitely my best option. Like, coming out of transfer pool, and I really thought, like, hey, like, this was – solid place to be but then like Duke had come into the picture late um but I would say like Duke's scheme fit me a little bit better because like I knew Villanova run a three-man front and um as you know I'm not the biggest guy so uh the four-man front definitely suited me better as a football player if I wanted to like advance hopefully to the next level and then it's kind of like you can't go wrong choosing Villanova at Duke education wise so it was like yeah yeah you were education was not a competition at that point so, yeah, so it was really just, like, I think what scheme would fit me better. So, like, and I think the format front would, I think, help me get to the next level. So, I think that's where that decision came from. Uh, was Duke, were they, did they get in contact with you before you committed to Villanova or it happened after? Like, right after. Because I remember mm -hmm. I remember seeing you committed to Villanova, and then I texted you. I was like, congrats, blah, blah, blah. And then it was, like, I don't remember how long after, and then I was, like, committed to Duke. And I thought I had, like, a fever dream, and I was, like, I could have sworn I just texted Nelson about Villanova. And then I went and looked. Yeah, oh my god! Yeah, he did. He did just did just flip his commitment. So what? Yeah, two blues, baby. But um, yeah, I was just uh, flipping coaching staff relatively recently with Coach Elko coming in, mm -hmm. and uh, they reached out to me. And so, did you want to do or anything before? Or it was just like Duke sold itself to you. Uh, I mean, kind of both. I did go on a, a visit. There wasn't many people here. I just wanted to come see the campus, meet the coaching mm -hmm. staff, all that type of stuff. Loved it here. Hence, I'm here. It's a great place. And you're so, playing Power 5 football now, too, which is definitely – Yeah, that's – Try that's, to that's say it. You can try to try to act like that's not a partial reason, but definitely – Definitely definitely, awesome. definitely different than what I'm used to at the FCS level. But, like, yeah, it's a sick experience so far. So – you talked a little bit about how, like, during your transfer portal process, different schools had, like, different formations and fronts. Was there ever a point in time where you considered, like, changing positions or, like, would you have been comfortable changing positions going to another school? I mean, not really. I mean, like, it was the same thing out of, like, high school. It was, like, I really want to play the position I'm at. And if I'm not good enough to make it, like, that's totally understandable. I mean, now, I'm not going to get you wrong. Like, the NFL told me you need to play this position. Like I will play that position, but, <laughs> so, but like in the transfer portal, it's most like, Hey, if you need to play the outside linebacker, I can do that. But like, I don't think I would play like middle linebacker, or like three tech, like transferring yeah, no, between no, no. Two different schools. Yeah. So it's like, I think I wanted to stick with like a defensive end outside linebacker, which is yeah, I can see exactly what like it is. A, I could see you being like a, like a TJ Watt kind of, where, like, you're just – if they put you a backer, they're blitzing you or, like, they're using you for run support. But, like, I feel – I like you when your hand's on the ground. Uh, you're, yeah. you're so much faster. Your first motion is just so – you're always a step ahead of, the, of your of your guard – or, excuse me, of your tackle. So, it's like so, – I, yeah. I really like your hand in the dirt when you play. I'm actually playing um, the, a drop defensive end here. So, like, we do two-point two stance a lot. Uh, sometimes you have hand in the dirt for, like, certain 
certain places like that's still learning all this but um mostly two point or whatnot it was like you're on the line in your playing defensive end but it's just like the two points help for movement and stuff like that but so i'm really working on two point stands get off but similar vibe but just playing defensive end no, for sure. so you talked grayson brought up tj watt being like a kind of player you play like who would you say though is like your favorite player in the nfl right now at your position either shaq bear or Melvin ingram like those two what do you think you like enjoy about their game the most? I like how Shaq Barry uses what he has at his disposal. He's not the biggest guy. He's like, I think six one three quarters, like 250, 255, maybe. And like he has a great get off. He's like his motor doesn't stop. If his first move doesn't work, he just keeps rocking with the counters until like he can find a way to get there. And then like he just makes plays when they're presented to him, like doesn't do too much and he knows like what's coming. So he's really it seems like he has great football IQ and anticipation and then Melvin Ingram was just like I think he played three tech if I'm not mistaken mistaken at South Carolina when he got to the NFL he moved to defensive end like walked down the guy's just a dog I mean like I love his hand placement the way he plays football physical aggressive like yeah I, I just love everything about his game so like those two I would definitely like to say I like to try to model my game after I take like points pointers from them yeah that's what I was yeah because who would you who would you compare your game to like who is a, an NFL player that you're like I like the model like this is like the kind of the style I want to play it like I want to be like this uh, I would say Shaq Bear definitely like I've watched his Colorado State highlights like he went undrafted but I still watch his from college like the way he can move his body like he knows like hey if this guy is so much bigger than me I'm not gonna sit here and try to bull rush him like he's gonna give like push pulls he's gonna use man like evasive maneuvers and that type of stuff to like really put himself in the right position to make plays so I really just like how he plays the game fluidly and then, like, obviously, like I said, Melvin Ingram, too. So those two, I really try to model my game after and take bits and pieces. Yeah. So what would you say? So let's say, like, you know, uh, everything this season goes extreme. This is your last year of eligibility, correct? I actually have two. You have two. So there's a chance you might stay there for another year. Yeah. Okay. So let's say let's say you kill it this year. You declare uh, everything goes in your favor. You make it to the combine, and they, and they, they ask you, they're like, Anthony Nelson, what makes you stand out over every other – defensive end that we have here what what would what would you say to them uh i would definitely probably say my dedication to learning the defense and my i would say instincts because like i'm not gonna sit here and say i'm the most athletic given person in the country that's just not true i'm not the biggest person but i would say like my motor high motor I'm not gonna stop playing i'm gonna do everything in my power to make the plays do my job um learn the defense in and out so i can play instinctually and fast so i think those would be my my selling points when you say instinctively is that kind of like intuition like you kind of just know what what's the right thing to do yeah and then like sometimes you ask a player like yo how'd you do that they say i don't know like it just happened so it's like when you like if you ever like you played a sport you just kind of do some things you're like if someone asked you to detail how that just happened you couldn't tell them yeah like you just shut the lights off and your body just goes to work yeah yeah for sure so if you were to enter the draft, what would be like you know, the one team you would like pray drafted you? Like if you could, if you could choose Bucks. the Bucks, bro. Yeah, what? Easy. What? I'd have an one Bucks jersey Bucks in my house before they even made them. Yeah, bro. Like I would cry if the Bucks <laughs> picked me. Yeah, Shout out Anthony Nelson, defensive end for the Bucks too. Like there can be two of us, bro. I promise. <laughs> no beef. He's the Iowa kid, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that. That's funny. That's awesome. It's actually funny you said that because, like, when I literally was, uh, like, before we go on, we, like, do background checks on all the players to, like, build up our outlines. I looked up Anthony Nelson and just kept showing the Bucks yeah. player. And I was, like, I was like, oh, my God. Like, And, I like, you, you type in Anthony Nelson Tampa. It's just, like, him. I'm, like, fair. Yeah, yeah. it used to be able to write Anthony Nelson Tampa and it'd be you. And now he even took that from you. I was, like, oh, hurt. <laughs> I just thought we could be friends one day, bro. Like, give me a follow on Instagram. No, Same that's name. Hard. hard to find. You went to Tampa, that'd be that'd be sick. That'd be awesome. Yeah. So one there, two the Steelers, and three anywhere else in the NFL. Please take me. Uh, why, <laughs> why the Steelers? Oh, family, like they just all love them. I mean, like my dad's side are diehard Steelers fans. So I've been a Steelers fan since I was a kid. Shout out Mike Tomlin, you're so cool. Come on. Hey, my line. You ever been to a Steelers game? <laughs> uh, I've been to one where they played in Tampa. But that was like a oh. while ago. They also, went to, I didn't get to go to the Super Bowl, of course, but like I remember going to like the the Super Bowl NFL experience when they played the Cardinals. That was yeah, like, yeah. I was at that sleep game. Yeah. Yeah. We were like eight or nine. Yeah, yeah. That was so fun. It was cold. Oh my god, it was cold. What'd you think about the Steelers draft this season? 
Mm. Wait, who'd they pick up this year? I'll uh, I'll get the receipts. I'll get the receipts up right now. Did they draft Pickett? They got Pickett first pick. Yes. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah. He wasn't. Was he? Yeah, he was only first round quarterback. Pickett, I think that's a great like steal because like you know our quarterback room, we were like having some trouble. Like we had to like Rudolph. He played, didn't really do the best, and then so I really think Pickett would have him, like open doors to come in, and give it a shot. I mean, what's worst case scenario? It doesn't really pan out. It's not like we have like he's. Yeah. Coming from greatness, because like Ben Roethlisberger is retiring, he's an all time great. So it was like I, I like the quarterback room's open, and so like we need somebody, and I have faith in him. And then um, was, did we get Pickens? Yeah, that's who you got. So yeah, quick, yeah. right before Dog. right before we go into this, right before we go into this, I just want to say I was a huge Mason Rudolph guy when he was at Oklahoma State. I thought he had all the tools, and then when he yeah. came to the Steelers. I was like, it's perfect. He's going to sit behind Ben Roethlisberger for two to three years, and I think he's going to be amazing. And he just hasn't done anything. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, he had all the tools. I just don't – I don't know what happened. I mean, like, you never know what's going behind the curtains. Like, yeah, maybe of the course, office yeah. is not suitable to him. So, like – but it just hasn't – it just hasn't really panned out for him. Watch, with us. If you watch his college highlights, he was – He's disgusting. 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 No, yeah. So, it's like, I'm not bad. We picked him on the team or anything like that. I was also curious how Josh Dobbs was going to, like, go, but he never really – Never really got too much traction. Yeah, but I just think so. I was a big Mason Rudolph fan. I was not a big Dobbs fan. I feel like he was extremely overrated. I just think he was in that Tennessee. We're back, even though we've never. <laughs> you know what I mean? But here, yeah, I might you know, not here's the picks for um the Steelers. Your first uh, round one, you got Kenny Pickett. Two, you got George Pickens. Three, you got oh. defensive end from Texas A&M, Demarvian Leal. Then oh yeah, I, animal, animal. Yeah, so so your fourth pick. It's my personal – when I when I met with – I went to the NFL draft and with Booger. This was my actual – my favorite pick, pick, my sleeper pick, Calvin Austin the third out of Memphis, wide receiver. Oh, he's disgusting. I watched him go to Filthy. UCF and USF. So they're like, he's too small. He's too small. He ran 4 no, 2 one. Who cares how small he is? They're not going to cover him. Throw him in the slot. He's gone. That's what I'm saying. The kid, like, that guy is route running, first off. Great separation. Great. He's a playmaker. Like, I've watched him – Cause I, I love watching USF. So I like watch a lot of that conference. So it's like USF, UCF, and I'll watch Memphis, of course. And like that kid's a dog, bro. Like he's the the, 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 what I evaluate guys on when it comes to the draft is I value, obviously I evaluate how they did during the season. That's very important, but I really was a big emphasis on senior bowl. So I was like, it's the most yeah. recent, it's the most recent performance they've had, which is what you want to judge them on. You don't want to judge them on what he did his freshman year. And it's also some of the toughest competition. And he yeah. ate, he ate at the senior bowl. Same with Travell. I mean, like, Travell got the MVP of the Hula Bowl. I'm like, yeah. I mean, so when I'm looking at him, it's like, yeah, you know what? If he gets hit by a big guy, he's probably going to get hurt. But that's if they catch him. That's if they get Yeah, like, like a slot receiver, like, I'm not going to put him on a, a shallow crossing route when I know linebackers. Yeah, no, no. He's a he's a big play player. Like, he can stretch the field. Like, I don't – I think he's a great pick. So. I think he's a phenomenal pick. I think he's a steal going in the fourth round also. But you're – And, seeing, like, just think about that, who you're running routes. Like, you have him, uh, Pickens, and Deontay Johnson. Like, match with Chase Claypool. Like, it's just – it looks like – Claypool stayed. Everybody. He's still there. Yeah. He's lost Juju. You didn't lose – you didn't lose Claypool. No, no. I'm yeah. saying – yeah. Got Claypool. So, I think – Sixth pick was Connor Hayward, tight end out of Michigan State. Then you got like Mark Marshall Robinson, Marshall. who's the linebacker at Ole Miss, and then you got the Tampa Zone, Chris Oladokun. Yeah, shout out Chris. Yeah, big um, Chris Oladokun. So I mean, I, I haven't watched the other guys too too much. I think Chris Oladokun is obviously a great addition, like Tampa native, and like we need quarterbacks, and he has the talent. Like I, I did definitely watch him in the FCS. So like, yeah, I'm definitely a fan of those picks. How did the Steelers do this past season? They went. What was the record? Still, still winning. They won the season. playoffs, right? Yeah, they yeah. Like we and eight or absolutely botched it against the Browns. Just yeah. a tough, tough first. Like we literally started off terribly, started coming back, but like the game's only sixty minutes, so we didn't have enough time. Yeah, I like how we kind of talked about how there are more guys now in the NFL that probably would have played like 10, 15 years ago because like before, if you were undersized as a slot, like. Wes Welker, like you were going to get blown up by hard hitting linebackers and safeties, but like we've kind of like fallen off so much with like hard hitting, especially because we're trying to like save players from CT, which I'm fully supportive of. But you kind of see how like defenses are at such a disadvantage to what the offense can now put together. Like it, it's damn yeah, near impossible. a passing offense, bro. Like yeah. you literally can't play receiver like safely. 
Yeah. Like you or touch. You have no choice. Though. Yeah. For, I mean, there were so many roughing the passing calls that I literally were like, like, how can you throw a flag on that? Like, what do you, I what do you sick, want? I was sick for the player, bro. Like, you just made a great play, beat the offensive lineman, and they just say that's 15 yards plus. I'm like, dang, that's Dude, tough. No, and the other one that really bothers me is the helmet to helmet. Because if, if, I'm, if I'm going – listen, I am all for protecting the athletes. I'm all for protecting athletes all the time, both physically and, and economically. I always want athletes to strive. And, 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 you know, they're more than just an athlete. They're, we're all humans. You know, that's like something that a lot of people forget, but there's also times where it's like, it's just like, come on. Like so there's so many times I watched the NFL this year where a, a running back would like hurdle a down lineman and then drop his head in the air. And then a, a linebacker would tackle him and they would go helmet to helmet. But like, he can't predict that the guy's going to move his head or like, yeah, so many, I think like, bro. It needs to be more like an intention more than like the actual contact. It's like, it blatant. It needs to be blatant. Yeah, like if you're going like launching yourself or like really trying to enter something, like that's 100 like reasonable. But like we all know what that looks like. We've seen plays being made like that. But it's like, like you said, if someone's doing something unpredictable and you're just like you graze their helmet, and you're like Nick, and you're not like launching. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think you should ruin that kid's yeah. game and foreseeably like the next week's suspension on that because there's only so many games you play in college. Yeah, or, yeah, or like, it's super hard for safeties too, bro. Like, if a if a if a receiver beats a corner and you're a safety now, it's like, do I even touch him? Like, what what no, am I supposed to do? Chip check him. Hopefully, he goes out of bounds. Yeah. Like, here was we got uh, kids like get ejected. And, like, we only have ten games in the Ivy League, so you're losing. You get ejected that game and maybe suspended the next time. You can lose twenty up to twenty percent of your season off of one. Yeah, play. off of so one play, like, off of one play. So I think it's I don't think it's fair. I personally hate how it only goes for the defensive side of the ball because you can't tell me that there are power running backs that don't lower their head intentionally. Like pretty much every time they're running the ball downfield, like it only gets called on defense, but yet we have offensive players who are literally head hunting themselves. Like they're just going to lower into contact, trying to like bait the call. Like you I just, just I wish it was like more, like more 50 50 at least. So then it kind of like prevents both teams from doing it. But I mean, at the same time, like to be honest, it's mostly instinct based. Like if I see a, big ass dude about to like rock my shit i'm gonna like brace yeah, i'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna brace up yeah exactly yeah i'm gonna try to protect myself and even as you hit someone you kind of like lower your head just to make sure like you get your head out of the way so you can hit it with your shoulder like you can't really control like the point of contact every time you can try but you're not gonna get it's, it every time also like the low man wins so, like if someone's coming i'm going to get lower and if he's yeah. gonna try to get lower you're probably on the same head level so it's like there was a play this past season and, and poor journalism on my end from not remembering the, the exact guy, but it was, I don't remember if it was college or NFL, but there was a play and it was, it was in the red zone and a linebacker stopped a receiver from scoring a touchdown and they hit him with like a helmet to helmet or an excessive aggression, something stupid. I want to say, I actually want to say it was Michigan state, but something stupid. And then they interviewed the guy after the game and he's like, what do you want me to do there? He's like, you want me to let him score? He's like, he's like, I'm on the yeah. goal. I have to hit him. He's like, I'm not going to let him score a touchdown. He's like, I don't understand why I'm getting penalized for this. He's like, there's no, he's like, the only other thing I could have done is not touched him and then he would have scored. He's like, I'm just trying to do my job. Yeah. I mean, like, it's, it's definitely, it's an offensive league nowadays, especially in the NFL. Like, I, I would say college too. Like, college is always like, College has always been about, yeah, college has always been electric. So, like, NFL is just, a, it's more of an offensive league. I mean, like, it brings in views, high scoring games, brings in revenue, stuff like that. So, it's like, yeah, it's what do you think about that, though, as, as, as a player and a fan? Like, the, the football we grew up watching as kids was run it down your throat, use play action, open up, or like have a bigger yeah. receiver. It was more, it was more like grit football. Now it's way, it's, it, it's way more fun. Dude, if you just play the Madden video game, from 10 years ago today to now, it's completely different offenses. It's completely different everything. It's all flashy now. I would say, like, there's definitely aspects of the game where you're like, all right, this is definitely a really cool concepts. So you can do a lot of things. But at the same time, I just feel like sometimes it's maybe a little too catered to the offense. Like, it's like a camp drill where it's like, all right, you know what's going to happen. Like, you know if someone goes deep, they throw the, like, throw a deep ball, there's a good chance it's going to be pass interference simply off of, like, bumping or anything like that. So it's like, I still love football regardless of which way it goes, but I just kind of wish that it'd be the referees and the calls wouldn't impact the game as much as it did. So mm -hmm. I feel like it's more like play instead of like, all right, these refs are going to give me 60 yards based off penalties in the first quarter due to like three pass interferences. So it's like, 
Dude, I think we're starting to move towards like a fully automated officiating system across like all sports at some point. Like we already see that in the NFL though. I feel like it's, it's one of the few sports you can't do that in. I mean, I feel like at some point they can get like enough sensors on a body to know like, Hey, like this is a foul. Like obviously like there's certain things that you can't like know, or that we haven't like even thought of yet of how to like, uh, like break it down to like a system of like, this is wrong. This is right. But like you look at baseball, like we're beyond the point of umpires anymore. Yeah, like they like, literally there's can't. No, there's literally no reason at all that. Yeah. Like, <laughs> these guys, these guys throw a hundred plus miles an hour. You, it's faster than the blink of an eye to react. And you're telling me you have to like read where a pitch is. Uh, the strike zone isn't even visible. You, the guy makes it up as fucking yeah. So like he's, you're literally putting the entire game in the hands of a guy that like, if you piss off in the first inning, you're fucked. Um, yeah. You see it in soccer with the VAR system which some people like, some people don't because they like, like, the aspect of human error. But I think in football, it's start like, I don't know. I feel like definitely in recent memory, I think of, like, the Saints-Rams. Like, that's a huge that's officiating like the, the, one. That's the absolute number one thing I think of when I think of yeah. I mean, either that, also, like, uh, what was it? Was it Des Bryant? Des Bryant? Oh, yeah. Uh, the Des, catch? Des, yeah. 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 And I'll never forget, like, Megatron. He had one in the back of the end zone. He stood up with the ball, put it down. They called it incomplete. No, but like, both, right. both of those plays, the Des Bryant catch and the uh, the Saints-Rams, the next week they made a rule. They made a rule to help them. The, the, yeah, no, they yeah, they like, yeah, look, we were wrong. Like, they couldn't have done it then, though? Like, it, I don't know. I just feel like it, it gives fans a reason to put, at, like, asterisks on things that don't need to have asterisks. Like, it, like, in a – Perfect utopia, we have the best teams playing at the end of the year and, like, you have the best team win. But usually what ends up happening is, is like, oh, this team was injury-ridden or, oh, like, we got screwed over by officiating. There's always something every year that, like, screws over one team. And, like, I feel like the sports are getting, like, too good now for that to happen. Like, we're really only failing on, like, the officiating side of the ball. I feel like personally, like, the game itself, I like the way we're going, like, and growing. Obviously, like, passing has become the end-all, be-all of football. But there's still I wish some see teams that, that that hammer that rock the Titans. Oh, you, you got you got, you got Derrick Henry. Yeah, yeah. Like honestly, I think the Vikings should more, but you know. Yeah, but they don't want to hurt Dalvin at the same time because you don't want to Christian yeah. McCaffrey. That's true. I'm a huge Dalvin fan, bro. My dad is forced to say, yeah. right? I'm a huge yeah. Dalvin fan, but let's say, like, ooh, uh, do we think James Cook is anywhere near as good as Dalvin Cook? I haven't watched him play. So I, I heard. I heard he's faster. I'm pretty sure he ran a better forty. I think he's faster, but I don't think he's better. I mean, bro, like the jeans. Did they even use league. him? Did they even use him to win the Natty? Like, was he even a factor? I, I didn't. I couldn't say I watched him much in college. Like, I wish the best. I don't. I don't know. I, you know who I think is gonna be like a great running back though? DeAndre Swift. That kid. That guy's a dog. Yes. Yeah. yeah this is gonna be a breakout year. Yeah, he's gonna have a good break. But going back to the officiating real quick. So this is my my opinion on officiating, and I feel like it's a lot. When the whole job of a ref, umpire, judge, whatever you are, whatever you're given, you're you're a, you're you're a rule enforcer. That's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to impact the game as little as possible and not have any deciding factor. But you're just supposed to enforce the rules. But in today's day, and I want to say you see it more in the MLB more than anything is opinions and like feelings get put into it. And then just like calls that are just like, just cause they can like, and, and that's not how the it NBA be. too. Yeah. And even that, and yeah. that, who is, uh, he was on the bleacher report podcast that, that ref that said like, yeah, we used to fix it. <laughs> I mean, oh, you're probably, probably not surprised. You can, you literally can like, yeah, you foul out your best player in like literally yeah. in a half. In five minutes. Yeah. Yeah, because like bro, yeah, we're getting three about... fouls early. He can't play. He has to sit. Like yeah, your coach exactly. is gonna sit him. Yeah, yeah. I think what you're talking about is when they fix the Kings Lakers finals, and like the Lakers didn't have any shots falling, so they would just anytime Kobe got the ball, they would just call a foul. Like they'd be like, Kobe, you're going to the line, dude. Kobe ended up shooting. Uh, I'll try to uh, find the game for it. Um, but yeah, you look at players now. Like there's running memes of like people like Scott Foster and the Tony brothers having like undefeated records against like certain NBA players like dude if you have trends like that where like guys just straight up can't win against certain refs like that should tell you something about how they're officiating the games towards players play styles and I feel like the NBA like 
either Adam Silver is the biggest genius in the world by setting that shit up. Cause like for some reason it always happens with the most crucial playoff games. Mm-hmm. Like it'll be like down, it'll be like down three to one and be like, Oh yeah. The, the Suns can really put the series away today. And she's like, Oh yeah. Uh, Chris Paul is like, Oh, and 32 against Scott Foster. Like, yeah. <laughs> what, what, what do you, what are we doing then? Like, at what, at what point, like, why aren't we just completely randomizing the refs? Like, I feel like it's kind of set up in a certain way. I'll try to find this. Like, There's way too much system. power in their hands. Like, and like, like I said, go back to the MLB. The strike zone isn't real. Like, you make it up yourself. So you can't yeah. even have someone be like, oh, you're wrong. Well, in my strike zone, it was, it was there. You know, like, there's just way too much power when it comes to that. I really feel like if you can go top golf and they can tell you exactly, like, how far, how fast where your ball lands, like, you can easily just say, you should be able to put yeah. where baseball's going. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like you can. I really, I really feel like you can do that. But, yeah, but like, the thing is that, like you said, the NFL is like a little, it's a little tougher because, like, everything, like, you can't sit here and, like, watch offensive linemen. It's like, all right, that's a whole, like, because then you'd have to have, like, the specific sensors to say, like, all right, this type of force, pull, all this stuff as a whole, or like this, this, and this, like, maybe false starts because you have, like, a sensor on the offensive line, but like, other than that, I feel like it, the refs do a relatively good job. And, like, I feel like it would be real noticeable if a ref is, like, throwing a game. Because, like, there's yeah, so I many agree. things happening. Yes, you like, football. all right, bro, like, this is – I feel like with football, it's too hard, too, because there's too many things to look at. Because you yeah, have, too many have a guy with the, the ball. You have a guy on the wide receiver in corners. You got to have a guy who's watching the line. You got to have a guy – like, there's too many different things to watch. Versus, like, in baseball, relatively, you don't, you could do a game with two umps. You only really need to, to watch where the ball goes, and you need to watch the plate. You know, yeah, yeah, it's like, there's a lot less factors involved. Yeah. I mean, I've umped a game by myself many times. And like, yeah, there's more things that you probably don't see or catch. But like the base of the game, where like there's a lot of force plays. Like the ball can only be in one spot at all times. Mm-hmm. Like Exactly. You just like follow the ball for the most part. You'll be fine. But I finally found out this insane. So it was the Western Conference Finals back in 2002. And the Lakers were playing the Kings. The Lakers were up three to two. So for the first five games – of the series the lakers were averaging 25 attempts the like 25 free throw attempts the entire game in that for, game, like per six, game on total like per yeah game. yeah yeah total in the game six alone where the lakers ended up winning and advancing they had 27 free throw attempts in the fourth quarter alone wait you're saying they had 25 and five games combined or per game no no, t- like they were averaging 25 free throws a game okay, okay. and then they ha- and then they had 27 in one fourth quarter that's crazy and and it was in sacramento it was in sacramento it would have forced game seven uh to be back leaguers but um apparently two out of the three men crew were like paid off or like had some something within the game that like they knew to like rig it beforehand so then they ended up completely screwing over the kings kings ended up go on and then the lakers i think ended up three peating so then that like that to me like I don't know how you let that slide. Like, I definitely feel like, I don't know. I don't know if they ever exposed who was involved with that, but that's like blatant times we've seen officiating. And then they'll only come out about it. Like, I think we found out about this because we only had like theories of it, but we only like really were like solidified in the truth within like the last couple of years, I'm pretty sure. So like these things like come out way later and then they just like have no accountability towards it. They're like, oh yeah, it happened. Like Dude, you look at the about, Astros. What about the, yeah, the Astros? I just want to say that. Yeah. What about the Astros? Yeah, it was really just like, uh, well, when you have the commissioner calling your own title trophy a piece of metal, uh, that kind of lets you know what that guy thinks of the sport he runs. Um, and yeah, he's just like, oh yeah, it was nothing. It means nothing, dude. You screwed out. You screwed over a team, multiple teams for making deeper playoff runs because this team was cheating, and you screwed a guy out of an MVP. You gave a fraud an MVP. Like you, that's you just screwed like- out guys that worked their entire lives and their childhood dream was to win that trophy. And you screwed yeah. all of them. And what was the punishment? Oh, two million dollar fine to a billion dollar organization. Yeah. Like, what? Oh, oh, oh! Your head coach can uh, sit out for a year. He can get resigned after though. Yeah, but you guys can go to playoffs the next year. Like, there's no playoff ban or anything. Like, I, it's, it's, and then that's but, why my thing on MMA is like, it's the best but worst at the same time. Because if you get a finish, it does not matter what the judge or refs think. It's over. But if you don't get a finish, they can completely screw you. Completely screw yeah. you. Hundred percent. I think another thing, um, just on like, what was I gonna say? I don't know. It kind of like slipped my mind. But um, maybe it's because your hair is so tight to the back. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I'm exhausted. It's been a long, it, dude. It's been a long day, dude. We had to get back from a baseball game. I was in the sun. 
well, we were in the booth at least, but it was hot as shit. And then we get back. I got my roommate call me. He's like, yeah, we got to mow our yard. I'm like, oh, we haven't mowed our yard in like eight months. It's 98 degrees outside. I'm literally whiter than like the color white. I'm like, <laughs> long day. Yeah. But, uh, but back to it. Have you had any games where you were just like, like you felt like the rest were just trying you, Nelson? You're just like, all right, bro, what's good? I mean, the Princeton game. What happened in that? Uh, they were – we lost in five overtimes, but like in the third overtime, we um we scored the game winner and they uh retroactively granted a timeout to Princeton because they were reviewing the touchdown that won the game. And they saw the coach in the back left corner trying to call a timeout, so they gave him a timeout. No way. That's not even that's not even in the rules though. Yeah, that that's that's not it's not allowed. So that was definitely and that was this year and we were both undefeated. Like they were fifteen and we were number sixteen ranked. And that decided that. The result did y'all protest? I mean, like, try. There's not much you can do once the um, what you call it, once it's called. So like, we ended up eight and two instead of nine and one because that one. Damn, bruh. Five overtimes. What bruh. was that like? That was insane. That was yeah. Were you just like exhausted? Like you were just like, oh my gosh. No, nah, I mean, but it was like after like two or three, it's just one play. So you're just sitting there, you're just like. Oh, that's right. Well, After the right. third one, yeah, because that's yeah, it's like I really hope this goes in. So it's, it's like one yeah. play. Yeah. And the thing at that point is like our, our coach didn't like rotate because like there's only just three more plays that you got. So it's like we're just sitting there, so everybody's just praying. Mm. Yeah, so that's not, that was gosh, definitely dude. the worst one. And then like after they retroactively granted the timeout, we were all like, "What is going on? That's not allowed." And then the next play, we scored on another touchdown, but they called an offensive pass interference where no one was touched. So it was like, so that was definitely, if that's anything, that's the one I was like, because they, the Ivy League put out a statement apologizing, saying like, that shouldn't be allowed, like all that stuff. Exactly. They always apologize. They never in the moment are like, we fucked up, guys. It's always after. It's always after. They don't really say you win. They don't give you shit. Yeah. They just like sorry. Yeah, they were saying they literally said like the game should have ended in the third overtime when Harvard scored, and I was like, all right, so can you take that L off the record or no? No, that's crazy. I remember when I played football, if I was like, if if I felt like I I was getting held a lot or something, I would always tell the ref, I'd be like, yo, watch watch thirty two, like he's constantly holding me, like watch that. But I feel like when when you get to a certain like this is high school, but I feel like when you get to a certain level, they just don't give a shit. Yeah, they're not they're they're not listening to what you're saying. It's like. But no, that one that was definitely the worst one because like it actually dictated an Ivy League championship. So it was like, so, y'all, so how does the Ivy League championship work? It's not. It's kind of like the old Big Twelve, right? It's just best. All right. Team. Yeah. All right. And you play every team. Like, there's not a season you miss against an Ivy League team. Yeah. No, you play every team. So it's like whoever has the best Ivy League record. Damn, there should be a so like, championship. That'd be so much more fun. Yeah, I agree. That'd be really lit. Um, but yeah, so we had lost to Dartmouth, and then we lost to Princeton like that. So that was tough. Damn. That was tough. Did y'all win the what Ivy League at all while you were there? No, no. So, like, but like that was a good shot right there, technically. Yeah, because, like, I only had – that was my third season. So, like my first one we came in, didn't have the best team. And then, like, my sophomore year, really struggled. Our biggest loss there my sophomore year was by, like, seven points. Mm-hmm. So I was, like, a little frustrating. No, I lied. It was – well, I mean, it was an out-of-conference game. We lost by, like, 13. But, like, in-conference, was like, seven points. And then finally this year, we were winning every game. And then – the Princeton stuff, so that was tough. Damn. So I mean, speaking personally, about, personally, like, I'm a bad. So no, what were you saying? What were you saying? Like, personally, I feel like we still win. I mean, like, if that's if that's how they want to win, it like, then yeah. I at least says should have won the game. I'm cool with it. You can't even like if you're Princeton, you don't even like. How do you even take that win? How are you like proud of that? I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Go, like ask, them. go yeah, ask them. Go ask Princeton. Yeah, I don't <laughs> <laughs> but um. Speaking about, like, the different kind of, I guess, conference playoffs, what do you think about the difference between, like, the FCS and the FBS college football playoff? Do you kind of like less seedings or more seedings? I think it's really cool, like, in their own right. I mean, like, if you're actually just talking about the playoff, I really feel like more teams should have a chance because, like, I feel like you playoffs are, like – it's not FCS, right? Yeah, FBS. FCS, I feel like that's just dope. I mean, like, it's like high school, like – FCS every- is the most perfect playoff system. No, it's just it's like actual playoffs. Like you get in there, like anything can happen, bro. Any given Sunday, like you play well, you play well, you advance. But like I think the FBS, like it just kind of gets a little stagnant because it's the same four to six teams you're gonna see. But it's like I feel like if they expanded, you never know what's gonna happen because you've had upset in bowl games. Like everybody watches bowl games. Now imagine that I put into a playoff, and I still think bowl games should be a thing. 
Like, because bowl games are really cool as is. Like, it's a chance for an athlete to be able to go on a stage that they're usually not able to go on to. Like, it uh, promotes businesses that want to invest in that, whether it be a local business or, like, a conglomerate. And it's, like, I think it's all around just great for the sport. And then, but, like, I, I do think the FBS players should be a little bigger. Just so you can, like, shake things up. It's, like, how do people feel about the NBA when it was just LeBron versus Steph in finals for six years? So, it's, like, people get tired of it. My thing is, Nelson, yeah. is I don't have – I can't give you, like, looking at it from, from the NCAA's point of view, who's the, the greediest organization in the entire world. I don't – I can't Probably. tell you why they wouldn't want to do it. Because it's Me only, only going to make more money. It's only going to make more money, so much more, more money. games, yeah, it, more it, television. It, like, it I don't – I don't understand. It only helps. But the only thing, like – and I'm talking about, like, years. I've been thinking about this for years, you know – this podcast a year old we've been talking about with, with college football players for over a year. Like I, the only thing I can think of that actually like, and it doesn't even make sense, but the only reason I can see it is because of control. Cause they want to control. Cause they're like, we, we, we want to expand it. When we want to expand it. That's the only thing that makes sense. Cause you're yeah. going to make more money. If it's a money thing, you're going to make way more money if you expand it. Yeah. I'm really trying to, it's like, I guess that would make them the only thing that would make sense. Cause like, like you said, it wouldn't be a money thing because you'd make more money. You'd make teams happy. But, I mean, like, they're not out here to make teams happy. So, it's like. Oh, yeah, they don't give a shit about yeah. that. <laughs> I really can't think of any downside to it. But, again, no. that's why I'm not making rules for the NCAA. Like, obviously, I have no insight compared to them. I don't, yeah. you know, play football. It's so weird that they're, like, against that, but yet they're cool with NIL and letting you guys make your own money. Dude, they're barely cool in NIL. They did not want that for the longest. Like, honestly, like, I think they're going to put some restrictions on it sometime soon. Cause, like, and I think they should, honestly. I really do think they should. Yeah, to an extent, 100%. Like, because, like, I feel like it's not good for, like, a young kid to be, like, because I think about this, like, when you have a lawmaker trying to put in, like, a law, you can't, like, you can't accompany that, like, hey, I'll pay the state $20 billion if you put this law into effect. Because, like, that's just coercion. Like you're literally just persuading them with money. And it's like it's the same thing with a kid. Like if you offer a 16 year old multi million dollars, like yes, most things 16 year olds do are like chill with friends, go to movies, and like play video games and sports. Exactly, like yeah. yeah, yeah, like yeah, I'm gonna be persuaded by more than six figures. <laughs> like Dude, I'm 22 like years old now. I, I'm 22 years old and I couldn't even tell you what I would do with a million dollars. I could let. I couldn't even imagine no. myself graduating high school. What I would have done then. When I graduated high school, I thought I knew everything. I was so entitled and so cocky. I thought I knew everything. And then one year of college, I was like, wow, I know nothing. I couldn't even imagine, imagine what it had been like if they were like, here's $5 million. Yeah, like, right now, I put it mostly in savings, like being adult about it. But like at 17, like, yep, yeah, I'm going to buy a nice car. Like, Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to flex it. I'm going to go out of the club and buy drinks for everybody. Like, I would have done some stupid shit with it. Yeah, so it's like, I feel like it would, uh, could be detrimental to an extent. But at the same time, I am all four athletes getting paid and like getting their bread when they can. But like, just knowing the NCAA, they're just not going to let it slide because it's probably going to collude sports a little too much. But mm -hmm. I still think kids should be able to get paid for whenever, like, whenever they can and whenever they should. No, I'm all, dude, I am all for college football players getting paid. Yeah. College athletes getting paid. I'm all for that. But I think there needs to be some aspect of fair. Like, yeah. It, what it is right now is it's become a free agency and it's turned college football from collegiate to semi pro. That's what it does. It's that's what it's done. It's turned yeah. into a semi-pro league, and and you're gonna lose. You know, one reason why we love college football so much is because the legacy, the history, you know, the rivalries. You're gonna lose all those if you keep shoving. If you're letting kids get deals with McLaren and stuff like that, like you can't you can't be doing that. What I do think you should do though is let these kids get these deals, but there should be a stipend cap. It should be like you can't have a deal worth more than two hundred thousand, or like you can't like there should be like a, a cap based on your conference and school. Like obviously, a kid at Ohio State should be making more than a kid at Bowling Green. Like, like that's just because it's resources and stuff. But I also think you should be able to make a percentage of your likeliness based on jersey sales and, and stuff that the school's selling. I just don't think we should have kids that are making $10 million a year playing football. But what do you have, like, a Heisman at Bowling Green? If you get a, if there's a Heisman at Bowling Green, Nelson, I will I will literally drop out of school, I'll drop out of everything I'm doing, and I will just become your agent for free. I'll do it. <laughs> if Bowling Green yeah, so is like Heisman, I will literally just – Stop doing everything I do, and I would just go work at the university. I'll go start working. <laughs> Arch so like, yeah. transfer Bowling Green. And now you're seeing That's Zach and I just saw an article the other day that was like the state of Texas is now their legislation is now reviewing to see if they should do NIL deals for high schoolers. It's like, bro, yeah, 
bro. Because that, that can actually take away from like a kid's education. Like at that point, it's like that's what it dude, with, with Quinn Ears. He completely really skipped his senior year of high school for right yeah. now. Because like think about this, like we know kids are like they commit like because baseball is like early recruiting. Like say kids commit super early, like. At that point, school's not really a priority anymore for them. It's just like, all right, I'm locked in. Like, I'm going to college. Imagine you get paid millions of dollars as a sophomore. Like, I'm not going to class, bro. Like, Yeah, what? I am done with school. Like, what am I going to go get a degree for? I have $10 million already. Like, At that point, you could really just not go to college and be like, all right, I'm chilling. Like, I don't have to really do anything. It's getting a little out of the question. Yeah, <laughs> I think it's also crazy because, like, I mean, at least from my experience, there were plenty of kids – I knew with like greedy parents or like parents that didn't have the same set expectations as their kids. So if you pass that legislation off to allow high schoolers to win, it's literally just all based off what their parents want for them. Like those kids really yeah, don't have that a be- say. Yeah. yeah. So like you're complete- lawsuits and lawsuits and lawsuits. Yeah. So Force like- your kids to be like a star and they're like, I really just want to paint. And like, please stop. Well, that, happens, six that happens with <laughs> child actors a lot where like they'll, they'll pay the kid and the parents will take the money. And they're like, well, yeah, like, imagine if your like, kid is like, though, actually, like, like, even though you're the parent, legality wise, the check was written out to the kid. Yeah. yeah. Like, imagine if you're like six five, bro. Like, you're really just like, you're in the artistic things, or maybe you don't even want to play sports, you just want to like chill. And then your parents, like, oh, you're six five, we're going to get a bag. Like, yeah. you're now off of the tackle. <laughs> and then you sign it. You're like, doing push ups, Shawnee. All right. Dad's <laughs> trying to, dad's trying to get you to college. <laughs> like, exactly. <laughs> So it was like, that would suck if kids sprouted up and like, yeah, just being in a sport, like you could get stars for simply just being large. So like that could, I don't know what that could lead to. No, literally, dude. Yeah, there's, there's kids that get eye offers all the time. And it's, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. I mean, do y'all know about like the Todd Marinovich story at all? That sounds so, so cool. Yeah, the USC guy. Yeah. The USC guy, yeah. yeah. So this is, this is like how I view it is like, so Todd Marinovich uh, from birth, his dad was going to make him a football player. Like since he was a baby, he made him eat a super strict diet, which stretch him out all the time, like would make him train football since the moment he came out of the womb. His only life had ever been football. This kid didn't party. His dad dad picked every girl he dated. He picked every meal he ate. He picked every class he took. Everything. everything. It was like a great player. Yeah. So then this guy goes to USC. Ends up being gross. Obviously he was disgusting. Like, yeah, he became like one of the best. Psych study. Yeah. Yeah. But then when he went to USC, because he had never like been alone and been in an environment where he could like do what he wanted, he immediately got addicted to cocaine and heroin, like immediately. This man had the craziest story ever. So after he didn't make it for the Raiders, because he kept doing like so much meth and stuff, this man went to the like arena football league, did me- through five touchdowns and a half did meth in the locker room, came out, shit his pants during a game, and threw two more touchdowns to break the record for most touchdowns in a game. This man threw seven touchdowns on meth and shitting his pants because he was so good at football. But I, anyway, the only reason I bring up that story is you kind of see how, like, what happens if you don't let, like, these kids, like, dictate their own future. Like, you can only love a sport so much, or you can only, like, have your kid be interested in a sport, like, so much before, like, you start pushing it on them. So I feel like by adding more stipends to like these younger kids, it's only going to put them in like increasingly difficult situations. Like, yeah, the money may appear good now, but you're only setting them up for failure if they're not like financially literate or like if they don't know like how to properly spend their money. So, I mean, hopefully they don't do it. Cause I mean, even now, Gracie, we were looking at that website where like they literally list your NIL market value based off what team you would go to. Like, yeah. dude, of course I'm going to look at what school I'd make the most money at. Like at that point, Screw the system. I don't care about what system I'm going to. If I'm good enough, I'm going to earn millions anyway. Like, why are you? Why are you even playing the game of football anymore? Like, you're yeah, just you doing it for money. You can't force your kid to love a sport. You can't. They yeah. can't you can yeah. guide his love if he's obsessed with it and he's like, "Dad, I want to be the best." You can guide it, but you can't force them to love a sport. You no, exactly. Do. You can't do that. Another thing I just found out uh, trying to look up this like. Todd Marinovich story. Apparently, there was another ex USC football player that was sentenced to 21 years, Owen Hansen, because he ran a drug trafficking and gambling empire, earning millions of dollars and servicing clients at USC. Sheesh. That's crazy. Solid. That's a that's a solid college career right there. But hey, listen, um, Nelson, thanks for coming on, my brother. Uh, we're Thanks, gonna bro. Wrap this up. 
Yeah. Wait, I got one oh, more okay. question. One more thing. I got one more. How many fifth graders, Nelson, would it take to stop you from sacking a quarterback? <sighs> like, are how they lined up? We have them just like all offense right. tradition that or like all right. you are we in pads? <laughs> wait, wait, are there are, is he in pads or is it no pads? Every everyone's padded. You you show up to a TBYFL like fifth grade <laughs> game. <laughs> You can have – you're standing on the goal line and their quarterback is on the 50 and you just have as many of them surrounding him in a wall. How many How many is it going to take of them fifth graders to stop you from demolishing that toddler? Do we have, like, rules? Like, can he, like, hold – can they hold me? Or, like, is it just – Oh, no, like it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's literally just get him. Get him. Oh, they, God, like, I don't they, know, like, a guy just, like, blows a whistle from, like, the heavens and they're just, like, murder. <laughs> There's, like, Jeez, red eye. I don't know, bro. Like, ugh. Dude, I'm trying to think. Like, what's, how how tall are fifth graders average, bro? Like, I don't know. Fifth grader, they're 10 years old, so we're going to look at – let's go with five, five, four, four ten to 5'2", 60 to 85 pounds. I would have to go 10 plus, probably maybe like 20. I, I would think, like, I'd give you 15 at, at minimum, minimum 15. Think about this, like, think about this, if we're talking like at this age, they, they're, they're, they can coordinate. They can coordinate things like attacks. They play Fortnite, all right? They get like all jump on my legs. And then at that point, <laughs> literally it's, it's tough. murdered one of them with one hit. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I'm saying like if they coordinate, you if there's like grab one space kid, mask and sp- use him to body the other. Okay, one. so there's no rules. There's, there's no, no it's rules. just like no, crush the carrier. <laughs> mm, that's a big field, too. Mm, I have. You're definitely nah. faster. That's what I'm saying. Now, if, you, if it's like I, whole I, field, the though. more we talk, the higher the number is going. That's to. what I'm saying. The more like, because like yeah. they'd have to like maybe do like a red rover all the way across the field. That's one deep. There's like one sacrificial kid. Like you have to go out, and we're gonna show them behind. <laughs> uh, it's shit. just, it's um, just in, a million clubs like just over the top, like just <laughs> black and so hurtling kids, bro. Like you just take off and just. You could know, yeah. You right. definitely could hurdle a fifth grader. You could hurdle a fifth grader. I would say. Now we think maybe close to 30, 40. Like if you really had a kid at just the middle of the logo. I think I think if you woke up feeling dangerous that day and you were like, I'm gonna I'm getting this quarterback, I think you could do 50. I really do. It's it really reasonable. Really, it, would, like, it would not be easy. It would suck, but I think you could do it. I think it's possible because everything like they really have to like block him. Yeah, because they can and like they can run up to you and hit you all they want, but you could just stiff arm him to freaking hell. Like but like at the same time, like some could really just be standing on the other side of the field, like they'd have to get through other people. Mm, yeah. I would say 40. That's I think my, the my, best my way would be come at you in waves. I think if they all came at you at once, you could like find a pack. But I think if they sound like 10 at a time, I think that'd be their best, their best way to stopping you. I think, I think he would turn all 10 of them into bowling pins simultaneously. If they went in waves of 10, they okay. would, they would have to waves of 20 <laughs> waves of 20. If one gets on his back, that's their best chance. They got to get the leg. That's what I'm if one gets a leg, if one gets a leg, you're sl- you're immediately slower. And now you're just getting jumped. by yeah, You, you got to have nonstop feet this whole time. If you plant your dead. No, it's like, you really just got to run. You got to run. So I would say humbly 40. If we're spread across 50 yards, like dispersed. I think I'd find my way through. Because, like, eh, unless they're a big fifth grader. like yeah, But I even a would... big fifth grader is five, four hundred pounds. It, no. That's what I'm saying. So, yeah. imagine, like, 20 big fifth graders. Like, maybe they could slow you down. It's I not even big, though, back. bro. That's not even How tall big. is 56 inches? How tall huh? is 56 inches? Uh, five, four, something, five, something. It says the average fifth grader is 56 inches. It's four, six. Okay, I... It, there's not a four six toddler on the planet that could just stop Nelson. Yeah, no, that's fair. Yeah, dude, um, yeah I'm this number is like 40, just getting 50. bigger. It's just getting bigger. I would say 40, 50 just because like I would give them the benefit of the doubt of being able to coordinate. Like, yeah, all right, guys, you're, you're, you're human. You'll get tired. Like, if they kick you in the shin, it's gonna hurt. Like, there's those little things to count. Yeah, they get cheap shots. You like, yeah, for so, sure. Okay, I say 40, 50. Let's go 45. Humbly, you know. Zach, what is your final number? I'm going with 50. Not for me, for Nelson, not for me. Yeah. I'm going to uh, it's great. If he says 50, I'm going to go 40. I'll take that. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll sit 50. 50. I'll sit 50. We're going to contest yeah, okay. 45. We'll be in the middle. Okay. Yeah. So I'll take on 45 fifth graders and get a football. Yeah. Yes. Perfect. That's fair enough. Yeah. Nelson, thanks for coming on, bro. It's been a long time trying to get you on. I know everything's been so busy with like Harvard and then Villanova and then Duke and like COVID stuff, but hey, really appreciate it, man. Um, keep us posted. I mean, we'll talk throughout the season. Would love to get you on again. 
you know, at the end of the season and stuff and recap everything and just get like, you know, just talk some football again with you, man. Thanks for having me on, bro. It's been great. Uh, definitely keep you posted. Just let me know. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Bro, See you guys. Take it easy.